Oh nice, look at that! The sun's out! <laughs> Play with the Teletubbies. Oh! <laughs> Recommended for age two and over. Would one year olds find this too much? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that this game isn't pushing the PS1 to its limits. Yeah, I know, a shocking assumption, I'm aware. But with that being said, why didn't they just use the Teletubbies show intro as FMV in the game itself? If they're not gonna do that, they could at least animate the models. How is this gonna get the Kitty Winks excited? <laughs> Nothing is happening and I feel like Dipsy's judging me. Where have the Teletubbies gone? Well, there. And after one of the most static introductions to a kid's game I've ever seen, we now have a character selection screen that's even worse. This is all you have, folks. No music, no sound effects, just the abyss of deafening silence while the Teletubbies look over their shoulders for the police after they committed arson. I suppose it doesn't matter, but for now I'll go with Tinky Winky, for no other reason than because while he walks around, he sings about wetting himself. Pinko Winko Tinky Winky, Pinko Winko Tinky Winky. Ooh, look at that! I found Tinky Winky's red handbag! Let's pick it up. Pinky Winky. Again, 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 again. What? He found picking up the handbag so enthralling that he wants to do it again. Aren't you going to look in there at least? There might be something even more fun inside. Again, again. Did I just beat level one? Okay, then I'll go over to the windmill instead. And after I click on it, it throws me into another cutscene. And I'm gonna ask this again. Why, when there's so little on this disc to begin with, don't they just use clips from the show whenever there's a cutscene that copies exactly a part of the show? It would look so much better than this. I don't wanna see the Teletubbies twitching on the floor after being beaten up and mugged. Oh, oh, okay, so they can use FMV. They just chose not to for whenever the Teletubbies are on screen. You know, the things that the game is about. You know, if I buy a game called Play with the Teletubbies, I expect a game where I, you know, play with the Teletubbies. <laughs> if I were a toddler that was a fan of the Teletubbies, why would I bother playing this game where all I can do is watch badly redone scenes of the show with fat and ugly models, when I can just watch the show itself on VHS? Equally, if I wanted to watch random people I don't care about engage in illegal dogfights in the woods, I'd just watch that instead. When did this game come out? 1999. Well, if that's the case, then the best thing about this painful FMV sequence is that all of these dogs are definitely dead now. Fascinating. Oh, Tinky Winky, I like your blowhole. You know what? I'm officially hooked. Let's keep looking around. What's hiding in the game towards the screen then? Ah, it's the pleasure dome. We go inside and as soon as we do, the game becomes Resident Evil, complete with pre-rendered backgrounds, fixed camera angles and utterly horrific atmospheric sound effects in the background. I don't know what to do though, so let's um, click on this thing. Uh -oh. It was time for Tubby Toast. Oh. Hello there, man. Why do we have a narrator all of a sudden? The Tubby Toast Maker takes us to a mini game where we can, what else, make Tubby Toast, then sit down and eat it. And all the while, the vacuum cleaner with eyes stares at you while you eat. Don't you hate it when they do that? Oh, and you can make Tinky Winky cough over and over again like he's dying from the plague. <laughs> Inside the dome, you can also make a bowl of tubby custard, except you can't because this simpleton decides to turn on the machine without putting a bowl underneath it first, so it ends up going all over the floor. And instead of cleaning it up himself, the crazy bastard decides to sneak away from the crime scene, leaving footprints of blood in his wake. Oh well, at least Nunu loves a bit of blood. Again, again! How about no? Five Nights at Freddy's. I haven't heard of this one. Yes, it has all led up to this, hasn't it? You all saw it coming. The single most viral game, not just of this video, but probably ever. Which just so happened to be a horror game from 2014. It's the one with that meme in it. You know the one, that meme. On three, one, two... FNAF came about from a guy who repurposed another game he made that was supposed to be for children but ended up being more suitable for adults, so then he flipped it on its head to make it a game that was supposed to be for adults but ended up being more suitable for children. One of the most unique and brilliant concepts ever. You are a security guard looking after a family fast food restaurant where the animatronic characters have gone wrong and they're out to rip off your breeds. Hello. You all know about it, so it's redundant me going into any more depth about it. But all I will say is this, without question, this is the scariest game in this video so far. 
because this was the first thing I saw on the Steam page. Then it got even scarier when I started the game because while worrying about all of the animatronics tearing my head off, the screen itself was already tearing its own head off, so I had to quit and then force V-Sync on every FNAF game I downloaded. You are the security guard of a family fast food party restaurant, just like Chuck E. Cheese, but this one is called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Shit. You're on the night shift from midnight to 6am for five nights straight, and luckily for you, during those exact hours, the animatronics have the zoomies, but with more teeth. And by the way, you can't move. All you can do to keep yourself safe is check the security cameras all around the restaurant to keep track of their positions, turn on side lights to see if Peter Rabbit is hanging out there, or shut the doors to stop them from coming in if he is. So why don't you just keep the doors closed forever? Because Freddy Fazbear is the chairman of Just Stop Oil, and he doesn't want you wasting all your power. You need to balance and prioritize everything you do to manage your power consumption while keeping yourself alive. But if you don't use enough power to keep your eye on things, then your punishment is... Same applies if you use too much power as well, except the difference is that Frederick Bear flashes you. Here's the thing about this game though. I don't get it. Like, I don't dislike it, but this was it? Really? This is the game that took 2014 YouTube G words off to the moon in views? I will admit, I love the concept and the simplicity of the execution, along with the designs of the animatronics themselves. They aren't horrifying, but they are very uncanny. At least they aren't a bag of crisps in a tie. But actually sitting down and playing FNAF honestly makes me feel like I'm working, which I, I know is what you're doing, but all it boils down to is quickly switching through the cameras, putting them down, checking the lights, closing or opening the doors if you need to, and then repeating the cycle. Am I missing anything here? I got into a cashier's trance playing this game because it's just you repeating the same menial, asinine task in a specific order and doing it slightly quicker on the next night. Five Nights at Freddy's is like working at a cash register until your boss yells at you in a fursuit. The jumps did startle me, I won't lie, but like, that's all it is. I get startled every time my granddad falls out the window, but you just carry on with your day. It was a surprise. It's not terror to your absolute core. I feel absolutely no tension playing this. It's too repetitious and daydreamy for me to fully get into it. And all of this is for a paycheck of 120 smacking lips. Is your poor man really that desperate for money? He doesn't need to go through this. I want to help him. Five Nights at Freddy's Security. My guy. Why can't we move? Why do we come back for more after night one? Why can't we save power by turning this fan off? Why are there huge heavy metal doors in my room that stop all four members of E17 from getting in, but nothing similar built into their room to stop them from getting out? Why are the animatronics better security for the building than I am? Why don't we bring a torch with us? Why don't we have a candle? Because now we have an Xbox 360 game based on a movie where two female cars flash their headlights. Rated E for wet. Make your friends eat your dust. Oh boy, I've always wanted to do that. On my 12th birthday, I actually got Cars the video game on the PSP. And honestly, I remember liking it. Problem is though, this is not a port of the Xbox 360 version, so I'm gonna keep my expectations pretty low. Contains no sex. Aww. We start the game off with a dream sequence where we have to do a race because this is called Cars and that is what cars do. They can't play chess. <laughs> and the racing mechanics here are... <laughs> they aren't the worst I've ever played, but I don't think I can call them good either. I mean, check out this power slide. Yes, that was me holding the slide button and steering at the same time. It's absolutely useless. Here is what power sliding is good for. Do you want to turn? Or do you want to turn? We finish off the dream and get an amazing idea to start up our own local Grand Prix because we're bored. He wants you to meet him out at Willy's Butte later? Excuse me, I am not going near anyone's Willy's Butte. The real game starts off and Mac is staring right up the back end of Lightning McQueen. Hey, howdy ho, buddy ho. Oh no. I think he likes my Willy's Butte. Okay, apparently there's a hub world in this game. I wasn't expecting that at all. Well, hey, at least I can crash into Mater. That's all I've ever wanted to do. This overworld system is downright bad. Check it. You need to drive around to find your next race. And if you want bonus points for some reason, you can collect these things here. But there are no guideposts anywhere. And the minimap does a pathetic job at not only showing you what kind of missions are available, but if you've even completed them or not. Leading me to do the exact same dream sequence race I already did by complete bloody accident all over again. And then I ended up mistakenly changing my look into a car dressed in 80s fitness spandex. Hey, if it's your thing, 
Gold speed. So I finally find my next race, and I said out loud to myself, Wow! Because, ooh, these physics must have been sent to us by false gods. The controls here, despite driving on the dirt, are rigid and strained. There's no sense of slipping or sliding to your steering. It just feels like you're driving a bus all the time. And yeah, did I mention the physics? Because they're here, and they're like a drunk auntie at the Christmas party that no one likes. This hub world, man, I can't describe how awful it is. Taking aside all the map issues and backwards roundabout mission selection system, it's empty. Empty, dull, muted in the colours, and I get it, it's a desert, but if it was going to be this bland, I would have preferred a selection screen. Especially since most of the races I did were mostly also set in the same goddamn desert. This adds nothing but wasted time to the game, and with so many awkward and cramped and tiny side bits to find items in, that's where you're really going to feel the control struggle. Does it look like I'm having fun here? Look at the turning circle! I'm braking here too! Am I a race car or a satellite? And then if you go into first person mode, you're able to turn the game into Resident Evil 7. This is uncanny and quite scary. <gasps> Cars the movie, the video game. You told me there was nothing provocative in here. What's with all of this bare chest? You know what? The only single time I think the controls didn't suck was in this tractor tipping mini game where Major is controlled entirely with the analog stick. And it makes you wonder, how does this rusty tub of crap move this responsibly and yet the car whose job it is to drive around in circles can barely turn left? Oh God, what's this? A power slide tutorial mission. Thank the Lord. Am I doing something wrong here? Please teach me. Nope! The game is just a stupid floppy, so I hope you don't mind, but I'm gonna leave right now before I go mad and kill someone. And what better way to go back to him than with Tony Hawk Ride on the Xbox 360. Tony Hawk rode off. So this game, this bloody game here, this seventh generation console classic just so happened to be developed by Robo Modo, the same lovely chaps behind Tony Hawk's Pro Hate My Life 5. And immediately you must be asking yourself, why such a big, big, big books? Well, because this entire game is controlled by this infernal thing. Oh yes, by using your body weight and these fancy sensors dotted all over the board, this game expects you to have some tiny amount of skating ability before going into it, or at least the experience of being able to stand and weight shift on a board. And I'll give credit where it's due. This thing is solidly constructed. It's not that flimsy. In fact, if you stuck trucks and wheels on it, you could feasibly skate on it. So, well done. Which also means I can smash it over and over again against a wall and it will never break. Wow, after 10 years of games, I can finally ride Tony Hawk. And in order for you to see what the hell it is I'm experiencing, I decided to install this special Jim Jam cam so that you can get the best view of every angle once Tony Hawk gets ridden. So right off the bat, this game begins in the dumbest way I've ever seen. Why go to the effort of making making a super expensive experimental gaming peripheral and then put controller buttons on it, including a start button, only to then tell me that I need a controller to navigate the menus and hit the start button on that anyway. If we were gonna do that, why don't we just, oh, I don't know, play the game with the controller? This skater just turned pro and now look where we're at. This is a true Cinderella story. Just a few days ago, they were called up by P-Rod for a special mission in Southern California. Oh, okay, is that it? That's our story? That was terrible. What even was that? That explained nothing at all. Does, does Tony have scurvy? What you have in your hands is one of the most advanced game controllers ever made. Oh, you don't say. Here's my skater, and his name is Bungalow, because his hair looks a bit like a thatched roof. Now, if you're a little concerned about playing this because you've never touched a skateboard in your life, I really wouldn't worry. Firstly, because this thing doesn't slip. And secondly, because even if you have a little bit of experience, like me, you will not make this game work. I repeat, you will not make this game work. I didn't even do that! Oh sure, I can push the board, I can manual, and I can certainly ollie, but performing specific tricks is an utter nightmare. This board cannot read the more subtle motions it needs to to activate certain tricks, and so on this tutorial here, the first three minutes of the game, no matter how many damn tries I gave it attempting this trick here, it never, ever, ever, ever worked. What am I doing wrong here? Am I not riding you hard enough, Tone? And this is just for the tutorial. Sometimes even things as basic as an ollie doesn't even register. For a game so focused on performing tricks and keeping balance at high speeds while jumping onto objects, the fact that this controller only lets you perform something as basic as a jump sometimes is enough of a reason why it's a piece of shit that should never have been released. If a new player has just as much chance and luck performing a trick as somebody who put hundreds of hours into it, the game probably blows. And taking that aside, the 
gameplay that you're treated with here can't be enjoyed, since you approach every single objective in exactly the same way. That being, you just trying to make a move happen. Forget combos, forget doing specific tricks over specific gaps or anything, you're just trying to do the basics from the start to the end. Mix that in with some pretty motion sickness inducing graphics and all the elements blend into a delicate mix of piss and vinegar. You're joking! I don't care about what fancy tech you have, I just want to spend my money on a game that works. And Tony Hawk Ride does not work. Look, I just got some of my highest scores and fanciest tricks just rocking the board in any direction I could. How is this fair? And check this out, I was able to get better and more consistent results by sitting down on the shitting thing. How is it that I can't do this, but by sitting on my stupid ass, I'm able to do this? In fact, how could they even say this is the most realistic skating game of all time when Tony Hawk's own series already said that itself a few games ago in Project 8? So real, you don't just skate it, you feel it. Five Nights at Freddy's 2, Pig in the City, came out three months after the original. That sounds promising, doesn't it? And when you play it, you can understand how. FNAF 2, in many ways, is just FNAF 1 again, but with ten times more shit to worry about. I don't like calling them FNAF. I'm gonna call them... Fanf. You're still stuck in the middle of a building and you're still checking cameras, but now there's three times the threats coming after you at different times, three times the amount of rules each of them work with, three times the amount of things you need to interact with on your mouse, and three times the amount of times you'll end up dead because of it. On night three, I got less than 45 seconds in and I lost. The dude on the phone hadn't even finished speaking to me and it was over. And that's if you don't keep on slipping up with your mouse. I can't count the amount of times I just wanted to come out of the security cameras and put on my Freddy mask immediately to fool whoever was in the room with me, but then buggering up the mouse movement to do that. You've got to go down to the bottom of the screen and then up again and then down to another bit. It's just silly. There's not enough actual button presses for the insane amount of new actions to perform here. Everything is done with the mouse, except the flashlight. So yeah, you'll be looking around your room to check there's no one nearby, and then sliding the mouse to the bottom right to open the cameras, and then sliding the mouse over to each camera to check them, then sliding over to the new music box that needs to be kept wound up or else you lose your face, then sliding the mouse back down to where it came from to put the cameras back down, then move the the mouse back up over in an arc to slide down to the other side of the screen to stick the Freddy mask on, all of which needs to be performed within less than a second to keep alive, especially in the later nights, while you're coping with all the same stuff you have to go through in the original fanf, including managing power, but now just at the flashlight, which is vital to see who is hiding where, but also scare away some of the animatronics before they come up in front of you, because now you have no doors anymore! I don't know how anyone can actually be scared of playing this when there's too much multitasking going on. I'm too distracted to worry about Foxy Bing Go.com, and I've got to use the flashlight, but only in bursts because the battery doesn't last long at all. So that means most of your game time is spent looking at the other end of your parents' camera when they've forgotten to turn the flash off. I eventually did beat the game. I wanted to see if I got anything out of the experience that other people do, but I just don't. FANF 2 as a whole package just makes me feel like... The ultimate problem for me in FANF 2 is that I don't either find it scary or fun. It's a chore for me from start to end. There's too much going on, too many places to mess up with limited controls, too many flashes, you end up making $20 less than the first game and Chica is now thick. Oh well, at least we have some cutscenes this time, that's always nice. Behind every little fish is a great white lie. What? You mean like this game being a 7 out of 10? The disc boots up and we get to see a pus spot with legs pulling on a chain and looking at it makes me feel sore and itchy. I've got a spot him on my bottom! The first screen has this, this, this and this on it so we're off to a great start. But I mean, at least the main menu screen looks pretty cool. It looks all underwatery and like a big... I also really like the transition screens between all the different levels. This looks really cool. I just wish I didn't get to see this shark's gums. I feel very uncomfortable. There is such a thing as too much gum and that is it. The first mission of the game is essentially a glorified quick time event. You see an arrow and move towards it. Nothing more to it. So we dodge the shark for a while, unable to decide which fish I'm supposed to be scared of, and then we did it. I guess that was the end of that. Turns out we were only dreaming though, big shock, and so we're treated to a cutscene with plenty of full screen shots of the fish faces, which is closer than anyone should ever be. So Will Smith fish over here, who's not voiced by Will Smith in the game, is late on his rent again. So unfortunately we're now being repossessed, which can only mean one thing, another minigame. Luckily it isn't another quick time event, but it isn't exactly thrilling. You spin in circles around your belongings thrown out of the window to catch them while listening to Ziggy Marley. Because every little thing 
It's gonna be alright when you're being evicted. I'm not sure what's more sad though, the fact that we're now technically homeless, or that somebody opened a shop that's very nearly Wang's Delicious. Ah, oh, finally! Three levels in and we can finally explore the ocean, which is exactly what the back of the box told me I could do. Let's go, fishy wishy! Okay, we can't. This is the first game I'm looking at. Um, I, I can't move. What's going on? This game controls like urinary incontinence. It's just constantly freaking out and completely unable to hold itself. This is easily the most spastic movement I've ever seen in a game. And that's when you aren't getting stuck in every crevice you can find. Moving is uncontrollable and trying to attack enemies with specific weak points is a pipe dream. It either doesn't register the attack or you get snagged on some other random speck of algae in the sea to stop you from moving. What are the enemies in this game? Well, whatever the game decides is an enemy. Seriously, the enemy are barely distinguishable from the other innocent civilian fish, and when they are a little bit more obvious, they appear from off camera all the time, ready to make Will Smith Fish's face look worse than it already is. So here I am exploring the ocean streets as best as I can for this stage. However, there are not only multiple path diversions to flip the x-axis, but there are also invisible walls everywhere, making it impossible to get a mental map of this giant level in your head. Even with a map feature, which even has bends in it. Bends in a 2D game. I have no idea which direction I'm supposed to be moving on this thing. Has anyone got the salt and vinegar? I want to put this fish out of its misery. Also, to get your health back, you go inside houses and then come out again covered in hearts. Which means that somebody in that house is going down on this. And what is all of this for? A mission where I've got to find three copies of the same identical fish that then magically transform into three completely different fish and then have to clean up graffiti around the walls that should already be washed off since we're submerged in the water. Next level time, and we've got a cutscene here explaining that there have been shark sightings near the city. And since Will Smith fish is the closest one to talk to, he gets asked on TV how he feels about this. Which logically leads to a Dance Dance Revolution minigame featuring this face laughing at you! I mean, this is just sad, isn't it? Was it kids game law back in the day for every game to have at least one terrible and delayed rhythm game? At least he's happy with the mess he's made. After this is another game basically exactly the same as the intro missions, but you're going away from the screen instead of towards it, and this is followed by the worst stealth mission I have ever played. Because you can go as fast as you want and alert as many guards as you want, as long as you hide immediately afterwards, wait for about two seconds, and then speed off again right into the front of everyone's vision. The entire level lasts for just over 30 seconds. I'm not kidding. Shark Tale is a classic example of throwing everything at the wall and nothing sticking. It's a kid's game, so you've got to give them the variety or they'll get bored too quickly, but I don't care about that. I'd rather have one gameplay style done right, thanks. And all of these issues wouldn't be so bad. This game is so damn ugly! Ugly, ugly, ugly. Even the health bar face picture is ugly. How do you even do that? At least we're all underwater right now because that means you can't see the tears in my eyes. And this is something that really surprised me. The UK weren't okay with the original Carmageddon. We weren't okay with the original Punisher. We're still not okay with the original Manhunt 2. But Postal 2, shove that shit on the shell! I am a bit worried about showing this game off on this video though, because the gameplay description alone is enough to make me nervous. Five days in a week, multiple errands per day. Whoa, shit! Features, Epic's Unreal Warfare Engine, Liquid Dynamics, Sophisticated AI, Absurd Over-The-Top Violent Content, and the most exciting gameplay edition of all, Gary Coleman. The game begins, and the very first thing we see is a strange man having a little dance with a cat, followed by a fart. And if that doesn't set the tone, I don't know what will. I made a list of errands for you on the fridge. Jesus, woman. This is our lovable and relatable main character, everybody. He's very nice. And he also has a dog that has a bit of a problem. And just like the back of the box said, we have a day of the week and we have an errand. So it's time for us to go and collect our monthly paycheck from our job. So far, this is pretty mundane stuff. We're just going to the office right now. And on the way, we play a little bit of bastard fish and then follow mushroom-shaped police officers into Chinese restaurants called Cock Asian where they sell the crappy cheeseburger. I'm really failing to see the controversy so far. Hey, you, why are you going into that condemned building. Get the hell out of here, you lunatic! Ah! Oh! When we get to the office, we then come across some protesters telling us how disgusting video games are, and I've got to say, they do bring up some good points, such as bottom, and this is where you figure out that you actually have a job at the game developers that make the postal games themselves running with scissors. We pick up our check, and then there's a cutscene where the protesters decide they've had enough of going ba 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 so they suddenly grab a load of assault rifles and storm the building. But I'm not here to kill these innocent people with a right to protest. I'm here to shoot people who insult me. How about some of this? What? Okay, right then. I gave all of you a chance. I tried to let you leave peacefully, but you've left me no choice but to shoot my way out. Why 
Why do you look like you're sitting on a horse? Ooh, this day is already getting a little too much for me. I mean, this lady was so overwhelmed by everything, she fainted and died on the spot. Oh, Christ, now the butcher's after me. What did I ever do to you? Oh, man, this is not good. Absolutely everyone and their mother is out to get me now, so it's time for me to run away, hide in a tunnel, and set these homeless people on fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a flop. Yeah, I really should have seen that coming, shouldn't I? Gotta say, though, I had no idea that my coat was part of my own skin. Why does it look like burned flesh? Freak. Here we are again, back to life like nothing happened. A fresh slate, a new start, and I'm here to help this community flourish with me and my dog. Are you... Are you shooting my dog? <laughs> What else am I supposed to do here? I mean, I haven't tried every key on the keyboard yet, so what happens if I press- Did I? Did I just unzip my flies? That's the ticket. Ow! Zip up your pants! Oh, can it, lady! You can't tell me what to do! Here, take that! Yeah! Rub it right in! It's good for your skin! <laughs> How much urine does this guy have? It's just a never-ending torrent of piss. It won't stop. And the pressure behind it. Look at my aim. There's no splashes off to the side or anything. And why does it look like Sunny D? I love this game. Oh, hello. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Gangly. You know what you could do with? A drink? That's the ticket. Well, would you look at that? Even though I've been doing my civic duty to provide free lemonade to the public during a hot day, I got arrested. I could always try and fight my way out with some matches and tripping the fire alarm, but nah, I'm too embarrassed. There's only one right way out for me. Okay, well, I'm not happy with the way any of that turned out, so I'm gonna try all of this again. And you know what the funny thing about Postal 2 is? If you want to, you don't ever have to draw your weapon or fire it. Like the box says, you have a list of errands to run, you have a shitty little life in a shitty little house with shitty little curtains, and you are left to deal with the issues however you want to. <laughs> Sure, you could massacre the entire town, set them on fire, and then piss all over them to put them out, but you can equally just find all of the neighborhood dogs and feed them treats, eat all of the dog treats yourself, <laughs> or stand patiently in a corner shop queue and legally buy your goat's milk for the wife. Hang on, what's this? Employees only, infidels keep out. Well, why? What's in here that I shouldn't see? Now it's Tuesday, and I have a petition that nobody is willing to sign. Would you please sign my what petition? What are you doing in here? Well, fine. If none of you want to sign this form, I'll set the marching band on fire. That'll teach you. Oh, hey there, young man. Want to sign my petition? Next up, we have Barbie Explorer. Action as never before. Oh, wow. Does that mean that Barbie might bend her elbows? And would you look at that? She's actually doing more than using her joints. Check out this epic minecart video sequence. This is some dangerous stuff here. Barbie is looking like she's loving it. She looks pretty excited about death. So in this game, Barbie has taken it upon herself to find the missing pieces of a mystic mirror. Why? No clue. I thought she'd be too worried about breaking a nail. But if anything, I'm a little bit confused as to why we're in the middle of a story all about a mystical power that will reawaken and most definitely end humanity if we find all the pieces of an ancient artifact. This is a Barbie game, right? Hang on, sunshine. What do we have here? VR training. What, like in Metal Gear Solid? Watch out, world. Solid Barbara's coming through. Now, in virtual reality, you can do all sorts of things with Barbie, like teleport onto swinging vines, walk like an old lady with rickets, not jump onto climbable walls because God forbid we put any actual fun into our platformer, and then we get absolutely decked in the face by opening doors. What's my name this time? KFC. Because by the looks of it, Barbie could do with one. She looks like if she pushes too hard, she'll snap her legs like a stick. So when we get into the actual game, I'm absolutely shocked to find out that it isn't very good. To begin with, this basically feels like the original Tomb Raider. You don't have tank controls, but everything else you do from climbing to jumping has an abysmal delay to it, which would be fine if the game itself was built around it and wasn't a fast-paced linear corridor platformer like Crash Bandicoot. You try playing a game like Crash where you don't only have Tomb Raider delay but also a jump arc that you are so committed to once you do it, you basically already had kids with it by the time you land. I mean, it makes sense, everything here has a purpose, but it's easily the stiffest platformer I've ever played. Bubsy 3D isn't this stiff, and at least Bubsy has more directions he can move towards so that his body doesn't constantly clip on angled parts of the wall and make Barbie bring out her funeral fashion pack. I mean, what else do you want me to say? Barbie looks like she has a moustache, there's no sound effects at all while she's pulling rocks that weigh as much as a truck, she outright absorbs herself into the walls, 
animals. And please tell me, where are you going, Barbie? Egypt, Africa. Egypt is in Africa. But then again, judging by your face, I don't think geography is your strong point. This is a game starring Barbie, all about Barbie, in an action-adventure game with awful controls. I mean, I really can't go into any more... I'm so sorry, these games are really getting me going. SpongeBob SquarePants Surf and Skate Road Trip is a game that... <sighs> You know what? No, I'm not doing this. I'm not even going to give this game the privilege of an introduction. Here is all the footage of me playing it. It speaks for itself. So off. Just so we're all on the same page and we're understanding each other, this is the main menu. I wave to let them know that I'm here. That works. Welcome to the game. I've not been identified. Okay, that's fine. How about I just select a pro... No, select a profile. No, select a profile. No, no, no. Select a pro... No, select a profile. Don't cancel, select a pro- No! What are you doing? Why are you following my face, like, to the side? Why is there a big gap there? What do you mean, stand back? What are you talking about? What, stand back here? Where do you want me to go? Stand closer! <laughs> Make up your mind! You may be wondering why I've invited you all here. No, I'm not. Can we skip this? Every time I go towards story mode, it doesn't- it doesn't want to- doesn't want to stay there, so I'm just gonna do quick play. Can this message go? To turn left, step your foot to the side. To turn left, step your foot to the side. To turn left, step your foot to the side. To turn right, step your foot to the side. To turn right, step your foot to the so- Step your foot to the side. We were this close to passing the calibration screen, everybody. I hate to see what the game is like if I cannot pass the settings. Copy this stunt pose. So we can handle basics. We can handle basic standing still and lifting arms up to do the beginning of the YMCA, but we can't do anything else. So why is there a whole game built around everything else that isn't standing still and YMCA? Ow. Okay. Look at me! I'm fast! Why are you turning left? I'm stepping to the right! I don't understand how this game works. Why, why is this a game? This doesn't work. It thinks I'm turning right when I'm stepping left, and when I step right, it turns left. Look. Oh, look. There's me. Hi. Am I enjoying myself? How am I getting all these points? I'm not doing anything. I'm just trying to steer. I'm just trying to steer. How is this... SpongeBob Skypants? Turn right. Patrick, turn right. Please. Turn right, you stupid, lumpy, pink thumb. I got a boost. I'm halfway there. I'm halfway there. I've got another... How many... Well, I've got another 25 seconds of this to do. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing a one minute long race. And yes, I know, you're all probably thinking, this is a surfing game, so what's the point of even mentioning it in this video? But the thing is, it isn't. Look, I can confirm from the back of the box that there is indeed skateboarding in this game, which is a shame because I'm never going to see it. Wait, it's it's not the lighting conditions are right? It's too dark? How can it be too dark it's daytime i have the sun you can't get much lighter than the sun spongebob square bob oh yeah you were all waiting anxiously for this one weren't you the one connect game i don't think i've heard a single positive thing about what a nice intro this is truly i'm grateful because if you leave the screen or sit down for any reason this little johnny up here disappears and the whole game pauses and no matter how much i tried this cutscene is unskippable so for the first minute and a half of the game you are stuck just standing there waiting for a video to end like you're waiting for a bus but instead of it eventually taking you to the high street you're taken to one of the worst racing games ever made i was able to get by every single one of the tutorial missions with absolutely no problem though first time attempt on all fronts actually but you know you're in for a good time when the little man telling you that you're perfectly visible from the connect turns from chirpy white to sad red after the intro ends it didn't matter what i did what lighting conditions i used what distance i was from the sensor what space i left myself even re setting the game and trying again. During the intro, it was happy as Larry, but during the game, it was piss off. And you know what? Maybe that is what caused this game to be virtually unplayable. Maybe it was my end that was the problem. Except it most certainly wasn't because I recalibrated the damn thing three times and it knew exactly where I was every single time. And more importantly, the menus worked absolutely flawlessly for me. Look, I've got no issue at all with any of this stuff. It knew what direction my feet were standing, it knew every time I did a jump, and I could even clean steam off of the screen with my hands perfectly. But leaning my body slightly backwards to turn a corner? Oh, no way, hose. That's far too much for this little puppy to handle. We can't turn any corners here. What do you think this is, a racing game? The best position I could come after three races 
Racers was fifth. Sonic Freeriders doesn't work. How many more ways can I say that? It murders your back with all the leaning. It hurts your legs with how high you have to jump for it to register. It hurts your arms with all the flailing you've got to do. If you really just desperately want to ache, go outside and run into a wall. It's free. Sonic Freeriders is simply a grim experience from the second it starts when the theme song screams its lungs out at you until you start a race and you slip a disc. Not even the menu's audio tracking works. Just watch this. I'm saying the word next and the Kinect knows I'm saying the word next because it's lighting up right there. And in fact, here is me using the microphone feature on Disneyland just so you can see that it does indeed work. Okay, here we go. Park map. Tomorrowland. Astro Blasters. But on Sonic Freeriders, like some stubborn toddler, it hears me, but just refuses to do anything else. Oh yeah, you can say next? I heard that. Great! I'm going to take a look at one more Android game that I was able to download and get working. And it's called Super Crashing Bird. Time is nearly up and my pants are nearly down, so let's get this over with. That's it! Everyone! We've ascended, life could cease tomorrow, and we'd all be happy. The crossover to defeat Avengers Endgame finally happened. Crash Bandicoot and Angry Birds. From what I was able to stomach, this is basically the first Crash Bandicoot game remade entirely with this thing, some of the floatiest, gassiest controls I've ever seen, and boxes with the troll face on. At the very least, I was hoping for this bird to look slightly tasty because it's making me hungry, but that's not a bird, it's a hairy hemorrhoid. This isn't a bird I'd like to cook? What? You don't like eating birds? What are you? A vegetarian? I mean, look at it. Look at it! You want me to explain why this is bad? <laughs> you want me to sit here and explain in depth in a three hour critical analysis about super crashing bird? You have eyes, right? And if you don't have eyes, well, I'm not even sorry because if you're playing this, you don't want them. Let this be a warning to every parent all over the world. If your kid asks for a Crash Bandicoot game and you're so cheap that you just download this on their phone for free, don't give that phone back to them because they will grab you and they will kill you. And then four months later, Later, they made another. <laughs> Why are there so many of them? I didn't massively get the first game, but I still liked it enough. I didn't massively get the second game and didn't like it anywhere near as much. And the third game is now the one that I actively do not like whatsoever. I couldn't stand Fad 3. I think this game is outright bad. Yeah, I'll say it. I don't care. What's gonna happen? A load of kids gonna come after me? I could win a fight against a kid. No sweat. So it's mostly the same deal as the last two games. Security guard, super glued onto a chair, checking cameras and stopping an old boiler from coming into your room. But it's a lot different. For starters, there's only one animatronic, Springtrap. And you don't have to worry about power levels or battery life anymore. But to compensate for that reasonable change, they decided to make everything else you need to survive completely random. The camera feeds that you need to see what's coming, the audio system that you need to lure things away from you, and the very oxygen that you breathe to exist can break down whenever it wants to. You're not in a building, you're in a PS3. And everything in the system crashing every so often isn't in and of itself a bad idea since you have unlimited power. They have to tip the scale somehow after all. But whenever you go over to the console needed to reboot the systems that fail, not only do they take three years to restart, but while they restart, you can't do anything else. Let's say your audio system breaks down, but your camera system and ventilation is fine. That doesn't matter. Once you start rebooting the audio system, you're stuck on this screen until it is done, meaning you can't go back and check the cameras or seal the vents shut to stop Springtrap from grabbing you, all because your giggling child button doesn't work. And if one system is rebooting and another one breaks during that, you can't start rebooting that one until the other one is already fixed, meaning double the time spent on the panel screen, meaning double the chances that Springtrap will kill you or flirt with you. What's he doing here? Ooh, hello. Don't mind me. Then in later nights, everything starts breaking way more often, way too quickly, meaning you have to rely on complete system reboots more frequently, which takes even longer and will 70% of the time be an end to your game. Should you be able to leave this screen while things are restarting? Is my copy bugged? Because no matter what I clicked or where I moved the mouse, I couldn't get out of this screen and I just don't understand the gameplay reason why it would work like this. But Caddy, I hear me asking myself, 
there's only one monster, so isn't it already easier? I'm glad you asked me, and no, it isn't, because at other points, which again feels totally random, you'll see a hallucination from other games that are better, and Fanf 3 gets so self-conscious about it that it decides to break nearly everything at once, forcing you into the same reboot panel again, and punishing you for not doing anything whatsoever. What are you, a nun? Most of Fanf 3 is just you sitting back, powerless, unable to do anything, and just wishing really, really hard that Roger Rabbit doesn't show up. Fanf 1 and two, I didn't love them, but I at least finished all five nights. But here, I didn't pass night three. I just could not be bothered and I could not care any less. It's annoying. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is a nephew you hate going to see. You tell me that this game is good or scary. I dare you. You look me dead in the eye and... Oh wait, sorry, it's hanging out. Yeah, and you tell me this game is good or scary. It's neither. It's made for people that think Eclair stands for electronic Claire. At this point, I don't even give a shit about the law. Playing this game feels like being a child, pooing yourself, then your parents grabbing your head and rubbing your face in it. I'm not learning anything, I'm not having fun, and now I smell. All topped off in the end by a casual lean from Fruity Springtrap. And then they made a fourth one. More like Goofy's f house! First off, I really appreciate them clarifying that this is Disney's Goofy we're talking about, and not a Serbian film's Goofy. This here's my very own home entertainment room. You know, where I watch all my favorite home movies. <laughs> What kind of home movies do you film? And here is the game. Check out this frame rate. Oh boy, isn't this good? Oh, don't worry about that. I just like to skin laugh bears. <laughs> so yes, welcome everybody to Goofy's Fun House, where everything you touch, you make noises from hell happen. Essentially, this is a 3D point and click adventure game where you find items, put them in other items. Your mouse cursor is this gangly Ow. moron. You move Goofy around this slow even when he's running, and half the stuff you click on nearly Ow. kills him. I sure do have a lot of books. It's just a shame. I I can't read. <laughs> then you eventually find a load of mini games that you need to win in order to collect more items and put them in other items. Yes! I did a win-win! You know what? The name of this game is incorrect. This is definitely not Goofy's Fun House. It's Goofy's Hell House. There's fish and peas on the kitchen table smoking a cigarette, urine in the blender, posters of steroid abuse in his son's bedroom, the walls are made of cheese, the garden is made of anus, Pluto has one singular giant eye, there's crying mannequins, ghosts, and skeletons in the attic. <laughs> oh, you're kind of and Goofy himself climbs the stairs like a molester before entering a single door at the top of the stairs that then opens up to a room with an impossible door that suddenly appears with demon magic which if it was there before should lead him out of thin air but instead ends up in a bedroom. This is the scariest game I've ever played and I wanted to stop. Burr. <laughs> How does it go? Burr. 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 Huh? We've been entered into a phone quiz. Ooh, a phone quiz. How fan. Where do you wear a golfing hat? Easy. Legs. How dare you! What do you hit a golf ball with? Easy. Golf cart. How dare you! What room in a house is for sleeping in? Easy. The bathroom. <laughs> well, you've clearly never had a heavy night before. Even though you definitely have. Goofy referencing Nintendo. Bowser. You know what? Max isn't home, so I want to snoop around my son's bedroom. Nothing will go wrong there. Oh? Maxi secret videos. Better take them with me. I will say though that after all of this nonsense, you're actually rewarded with full length classic Goofy short films. There's six of them on the disc actually. And I've got to admit, that's the best thing in the game. This is a really good reward. Now where's that pump Mickey gave me for my birthday? And I don't know why, but I oddly got into this one. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Does that make me a psychopath? I vividly remember the excitement surrounding this one. I mean, stop and think about it for a second. It's a Star Wars game that uses your arms to control the action, which meant force powers with your arms, and more importantly, lightsaber swinging. But that's not all people were excited about, because along with Dirty Lies the video game, there are also four additional main games to play through. Whoa. I suppose we'd better start off with the one they actually showed off, though, that being Jedi Destiny. Ooh. But who do I pick from this classic live up of characters. It's a problem to decide. Do I pick Ara Barotta, Zitara Man, Tren Alva, Fenella Druce? <laughs> Fenella Druce? No, I know exactly who to pick. Dar Singe. Dar Goddamn 
sins. And that's a bit of a problem because I'm not ready for them. I'm only a trainee Jedi, and how am I gonna fight the dark side if I can't even avoid a metal sphere shooting me in the bum bum? Feel the force flow between you and the pedestal. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling the force, yeah! Now what is the one thing everyone loves about the Star Wars movies? That's right. What are the lightsaber battles? They're climactic, fast-paced, passionate, intricate, and all of that is captured perfectly in Star Wars Connect, as you stand still and move your hand every so often to block attacks, after which you push the enemy back and then pretend to haphazardly paint a fence in order to attack back. Those are all the lightsaber battles are, and I know this because the Jewels of Fate game mode is nothing but lightsaber battles, and it's the exact same thing as this. So off we go with Yoda and crew to save the Wookiees. Time of trials is time of danger. Great hope in you, we have. <laughs> That's the worst Yoda impression I've ever heard. It's not even close. <laughs> Say the same for you. We once did. Now we have to learn how to run, jump, kick, and sidestep in the Wookiee's training grounds. And I've got to be honest, the delay in the Kinect trying to read when I stop leaning forward is probably the best thing about the game because it means I'm able to perform the very basic action of moving forward and stopping at the right times whenever I want to without any issues at all. Your strength comes from the Force. Control it, you will. Wow, I get to move rocks with my hand and throw them at other rocks? This is what the Kinect was made for. I'm a true Jedi. <laughs> After this, we're then given eight minutes of pretending to steer a speeder through the trees, occasionally pulling back in order to avoid getting shot at, and then carrying on. That's it. Nothing else happens here for eight entire minutes, aside from the greatest line of dialogue I've heard from any game ever. Trees! And after this is when you discover what the rest of Jedi Destiny is all about. Standing still and airing out your pants. This single movement solves all of your problems. Sure, you can be strategic by using the force to knock out multiple opponents, or do jumping smash attacks for wide reaching damage, but why bother with any of that when this single movement is able to deflect every bullet that's fired at you, bounce them back at your enemies, and then make you automatically fly towards every enemy and slice them into pieces. The only time I had to think here was when I was being blocked, at which point you just need to jump in the air to get behind the enemy and start waxing on and waxing off all over again. And the other game modes aren't anything to ride home about either. You've got the boring Duel of Fates mode, which I've already discussed, pod racing, which is basically just that speeder segment in the trees from earlier, but just more uncontrollable and more unplayable, Rancor Rampage, which is honestly just dull, even though every single family on screen is dying horribly. But that's not the problem, it's repetitive. Who would have thought that genocide would be repetitive? Sure, you have missions to complete, like throw a person a certain distance or land on top of a person. What the f- You don't need to think really. Just do this and you'll be set. Stomp around like a big baby. Wave your arms in the air like you actually care a little bit and watch in horror as this family friendly Star Wars game included a mode where you literally eat a father of four after stepping all over his house. Just don't bother trying to charge though. The game seriously does not work when you try it. I am really trying to make it work. What do you want me to do game? I'm copying the movement. I look like I'm trying to start a car from the 1930s. Why can't I make this thing charge? <laughs> but all of this, this isn't why you stayed this long into the video, was it? Because there's one more game mode on Star Wars Connect that we just have to talk about. And it is known as Galactic Dance Off. Do you think Harrison Ford knows about this? Do you think he likes this? Do you think he did the motion capture for it? Even though I knew exactly what was coming when I clicked on this game, I still didn't know how to react to it when it came on screen. That is how much of a culture shock this shit is. But you know what? It's the best working part of the entire game. It seems to know how well your body is copying most of the moves, and it's hilarious. Oh, it's fun, shut up. They took the song Holoback Girl and changed it to Hologram Girl with Sebulba on the front. Get a sense of humor. In fact, the only thing that stopped me from playing any more of this is one simple fact. I can't dance to save my life. Those famous Bigfoot tapes are not real, and I'll tell you why because they were filming me. But hey, at least my girlfriend Karis can dance, so she took over the second I gave up, and she will do anything for a till of the hand. And so, I learned my lesson about buying bad Pixar games and decided to pick up Cars 2 on the Xbox 360. Fantastic. Wheel good fun. <sighs>
Where's my gun? The intro cutscene for Cars 2 shows us a rip-roaring chase sequence and it ends with a cute little crash where a group of cars pile on top of each other and explode. Cars 2 begins with literal car genocide! I was gonna pick Luigi for my playthrough here, seeing as, for some reason, he's faster than most of the other literal professional racing cars and yet looks like an old shoe. In the end, though, I went with Lightning because I think he'll kill me if I don't. Once the game itself begins, though, I'll be damned, it's actually alright. In fact, dare I say, this is a good racing game for kids and even for adults. This here, this is a good game. It's not even vaguely the same as Cars 1 in terms of racing mechanics. This feels way more fleshed out and looks much more lively and vibrant with more tracks to race around that all look tons better than before. You've not only got a drifting system that's worth a damn, but also a load of new moves to use during the races that add a lot of risk and reward to what you're doing and therefore makes every race interesting even when you're in front. You see, you have this new boost system down here that fills up whenever you take a risk and do some tricky stuff with the right stick. You can flick up to drive up on two wheels and make your steering very limited, flick back to drive in reverse and swap the left and right controls around, and tap A to jump up and over different obstacles and even jump off of ramps to reach shortcuts. Much like in Sonic All-Stars Racing, you can even do stunts in mid-air by flicking the right stick. If you can keep a good streak of these going without using one of the three mini boosts you can save up, once you get your fourth mini boost, you can then activate a massive boost which lasts for ages, goes really quickly, and knocks out any other racer around you. You can even get more boost fuel by doing certain stunts through certain highlighted routes, and you can interrupt other racers doing their own stunts by smashing the right stick left and right while driving on the floor. Because you also get races that allow you to use items and power-ups. Cars 2, of all things, arguably one of the worst 3D animated movies ever made, ended up with a good game. I'm sorry, news of the world, you earned that pun. That pun is correct. Recycling? No! This really surprised me, so well done, Cars 2. Which is something I never thought I'd ever say. Wait a second. That isn't a B. It's a hand passing me B movie on the- Ah uh, yes, from one meme to another, what better way to rinse my brain out than with jumping two console generations from PS1 to Xbox 360. Contains no material likely to offend or harm. Thanks for the warning, B movie. I never would have figured. So B-Movie the video game was developed by the developers of Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled, b -Nox, and I'm convinced that they were picked for the sake of a pun and nothing else. Oh, and don't worry, that is not the only B pun they have. I've got some too. I hadn't heard about the video game. It's both challenging and entertaining. Well, you know what, lady? You're a lying cow. Because this is without a doubt one of the easiest games I think I've ever played. You get an achievement for getting into a car. No, not driving the car, getting inside the car. And you even get an achievement for pressing the left trigger. I wish I was making that up. You can hijack any car in the whole game, actually. This is more or less a kid-friendly version of BTA. Hey! Even better, there's no consequences for that either. You can even steal cars that are already being driven, and the bee that you take it from just drops whatever he's doing and becomes your chaperone. You know what this game reminds me of sometimes? Banjo Kazooie. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm assuming it's a collectathon at least, because to be honest, I didn't really play the game. It was way more fun to break it into pieces. That is, of course, when the game isn't pestering me every 30 odd seconds yelling at me to go to an objective marker. Come on, you give me this huge world to explore and won't shut up until I comply? I'm afraid I'm gonna have to be a naughty man and disobey. <laughs> You really should get a job. Well, you should really walk around the bin. No, stop it. No, don't invite your friends. Get your weird cloned granny lovers off of my porch. I want to crash my car. Who's the unlucky insect in the way today then? Oh yeah, it's definitely you. Get ready to feel my sting a bit. Oh. Well, that was disappointing. Just going to drive a little bit further, push you into the corner and yeah. I think I'll leave you there. You know what? All the residents of this hive are totally screwed up now that I think about it. I mean, what in the blazes is going on over here? Hello? Are you melting? Is anybody gonna help him? Oh! Ooh. No worries, everyone. He buzzed off. Hey! Okay, so I hijack this guy's car, force him to crazy taxi me over to my objective, and that was a grave error because now he's following me to the ends of the earth and is stuck in the lift with me to continue the story. I'm terrified. He looks like he's about to unhinge his jaw and swallow me. After this, I decided to actually try playing the game, and once I ignored my surroundings and went from point to point, that's when I noticed that this is a job simulator, and it is horrifically dull. I get it, they want me to fit in with the hive and do my job like a good little subservient worker bee, but I'm one step ahead of you game. I don't want to be like every other bee, so I'm going to go back to my boring house to watch boring TV and look at boring pictures of myself duplicated three times on the same boring table. Oh look, it's another game where I have to move away from attacks as arrows appear on the screen. Is that feeling deja vu? 
Or have I eaten too many olives again? At least after this, you get to go outside and explore the park with a pollination gun, sucking up all the pollen on the flowers, spraying it all over the dying flowers, and fighting off dragonflies. There's just one problem with this, though. The game turns into Elvis Presley before he died, unable to move properly. A PS1 game of Shrek I could at least understand the choppy frame rate for, I suppose. But this? Are you telling me the Xbox 360 is struggling to run this frog and children that have been dipped in wax? This performance makes this part of the game unplayable, especially when the camera has a total mind of its own. I'm going to move on to the next game, I think. This game was everywhere. You could not escape it. And now I'm bringing it back again because I hate you. Slender came out in 2012 and is based on the infamous something awful forum fictional monster Slenderman. A gangly long-limbed creature with tentacles, no face, a dapper suit and a nasty habit of teleporting around and stalking then kidnapping children to take them back to his private island. You are... I have no idea. And you are in a forest because... I have no idea, and you need to collect eight pages scattered around the forest because Slenderman wrote down all of his passwords for his 4chan and Ashley Madison account, rookie error man. As you start finding more and more pages, Slenderman becomes incrementally more aggressive with stalking and chasing you, and as soon as you find the first page, he even begins banging a drum to let you know he's on the pull. Look, I really don't know the point to any of this. I don't know why we're here, what we're doing this for, why the pages are important, and why Slenderman gets increasingly more upset with you for taking them. You just have to accept it. As much as you have to accept that the game itself isn't that goo. With a silent... Duh. You just walk forward, pray that the pages have spawned in locations you can easily find, turn around whenever you see Slend, and then whenever the screen goes a bit staticky, that means Slenderman is close by, so just keep moving in another direction. Follow these steps, and eventually you'll just win. It's only a matter of time. Sorry, I mean it's only a matter of patience, because... Oh, this is the slowest piece of dump I've ever seen rolling down a hill. And I see them a lot. I work at the slow rolling dump factory. There is absolutely no reason why you should move this slow. My grandma moves quicker than this and she's dead. What makes it worse though is sprinting because you do go a little bit faster, but because of some terrible motor development skills in childhood, your man can't move faster while holding his only source of light in front of him. And that light doesn't affect the game in any way. It just makes you able to, you know, See, do you want to walk slowly into something or sprint slowly into nothing? This game has so many choices. There's at least three. The pages aren't even that hard to find anyway because they all spawn in specific landmarks that we all recognize from our local forests. Like the popular forest shower rooms with no toilets and a sad chair. Or the popular forest gas canisters. Or the popular singular wiggling tree. Or the popular forest tubes with nothing in them. Or the popular giant rusty forest cylinders. Or my favorite, the world famous landmark of the perfectly aligned identical rows of giant sausages. And by the way, for such an abhorrent psychological stalking kid kidnapping menace, Slend doesn't ever show up. Instead of playing the game itself, I preferred to play Find the Thing the Game is Named After, because that in itself is much harder than actually finding the eight pages. Whenever static begins happening, I deliberately looked around and he just isn't there. And whenever I turned a corner after grabbing six pages, which is when he's supposed to be popping up all over the place, he's never there. Follows? Does he? That's news to me. Always watches? No eyes? Actually, that adds up. I can't find him because he has no eyes to see where the hell he's going. Help me? From what? Even if he does catch you, he just looks at you and the game ends. Leave me alone? Well, yeah, you don't have to worry about that. He left me alone hours ago. I wonder if there's a page that describes exactly how I'm feeling right now. Oh, here it is. No, 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 no. And why do you deliberately blind yourself every time you move a little bit faster? In fact, how are you even sliding along so smoothly? Are you a pensioner that got lost at 10 p.m. on his way to the co-op? You know what, I'm gonna keep tapping shift to sprint a little bit while also keeping my torch halfway up the screen to see. It's the best I can- S 
Ow. I can't even look at this like, oh, well, Slenderman looks a lot like the tree, so your mind plays tricks on you, because you look at this and tell me that you would confuse it with a tree. He doesn't even look disturbing on his own. That's not an interdimensional stalker. It's a guy who missed the bus and is watching it leave. And when you eventually do see him, he doesn't do anything scary either. He just stands there and does nothing like a child at Disneyland too nervous to say hello to Goofy. And by the way, for a free game and being made by one person, everything else in this game looks all right. So why is it that the main threat that the game is named after the worst looking part of it? Why is he like this? Oh, and on my first attempt of finishing the game, do you want to see how I died? Everything was cool, no static, no following around, no nothing. I grabbed a page and then... Yeah, that was fair, wasn't it? Now you start from the beginning and very slowly slide around looking for pages all over again. And then on my second attempt, the exact same thing happened. I found this scary 10 years ago. You know what though, I shouldn't laugh because whenever you chuckle, it makes you a cuckle. And trust me, you don't want to be cucked by Slendy. Christ, another one? Yay, thanks comically small hands. I can't wait to play Barbie Race and Ride. Barbie, software for girls. <laughs> Sure. When you hit start, it loads. When you pick a horse, it loads. When you pick the horse's name, it loads. When you ride the horse, it loads. When you get off the horse, it loads. When you click on something you want to do off the horse, it loads. When you confirm that you definitely did want to do that thing by clicking on it again, it loads. When you're done with the thing you want to do, it loads. When you want to get back on your horse, it loads. You know what? You're right. These games are made for girls because as we all know, girls just love being stuck waiting around for things to happen. You know, like when they had to wait for the vote. Here's my horse and I called him the worst name I could find in the list. Bay Baby. Baby the horse. And here is the game. Yes, this is the game. I'm not joking. What you have is the worst FMV I think I've ever seen, while all you do is make a bad quality gif of a horse head, move its head left and right, and jump every couple of minutes. But as far as moving left and right goes, you don't need to do that. It doesn't matter. This is a predetermined path. It's all automated, so there's no point moving left or right at all. While this is all going on, every so often Barbie will see a pebble that she just loves so much that you have to stop. At which point you get an insultingly easy mini game, or you just get to point at a stupid animal and then you get back on your horse and carry on until you're stopped again. This is the entire game, just pointless and inconsequential horse riding that then gets interrupted with pointless and inconsequential mini games. May I ask, where's the racing? And I never thought I'd ask this, but where's the horse education? All I know so far is that some insane people out there call their horses baby. And the best bit is that even after all the fuss barbecue makes about that funny looking leaf she saw, you click on the thing she sees to go to a mini game and it's more often than not an action packed thrill ride like this. Wait, 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 wait. Is that... Is that a race? Oh, oh my god, it's an actual race in a game with race in the title! And even better, we have Barbie on Baby! Racing is so much fun! Uh... I mean, I get that this is for really young children, but at least Barbie Explorer was an actual game with graphics. Jesus Christ RPG. Okay! We start off in a nice little house where we keep water, fish and eggs in treasure chests and then waddle our way over to Mother Mary to let her know we're leaving to get our first Pokemon. Both I and your father, I mean, Joseph, will miss you. Oof. Sneef. Sneef. We walk around the town, talk to people, and find out that we can't help the organ player get wrecked because I can't perform miracles yet without travelling to the desert to get baptised. Because even if you are the son of God, you're still useless until you get wet. We go to the oasis to get baptised and come out looking like a stupid baby. As it turns out, I learned exorcism. And all it took was me getting a little bit damp. Suddenly, Satan of all people appears and he is looking fire. If this guy is supposed to be the root of all evil, why do I want to get a beer with him? He tries tempting us to jump off of a cliff to prove that we are as great as we say we are. And we reply, you are not to put the Lord your God to the test. Pussy. And because of that cop out, Satan sends Beelzebub after us with all of his minions. In brown trousers. Time for a battle then. Yeah. Demonic fly uses smelly finger. You know what? I don't want to fight anymore. Which is good because in the game, I can always choose to refrain. I mean, after all, that is what dad would want. Well, I died. And we get the greatest message I've ever read. Jesus Christ was defeated. <laughs> Sorry, Christians. Right then, I guess we can't fix every problem with peace, so it's time for Jesus to cut. Kill the demon, go to hell. Kill the demon, go to hell. Kill the Lord of the Flies, go to hell. And the Bible lesson we learned today, kids, is that violence solves everything. Jesus Christ RPG is an RPG where you walk around an overworld, explore buildings, talk to people for advice and items, buy weapons and armor, find party members in the form of disciples, level up with experience points to learn new miracles, and attack everyone that disagrees with you in turn-based battles. Ha ha ha. 
<laughs> How tabled the turn. Sadly, though, you can't walk on water. You're not my Jesus. You can't progress throughout the game without obtaining certain miracles, which you can use in combat as well as the overworld. But in order to get those miracles, you have to do a lot of fights to get a lot of XP. I don't remember that bit in the Bible where Jesus had to grind. The thing is, though, this game may be on Steam, but it's totally free to download, and it's a totally functional RPG. I've got no complaints about it, really. Finally, after all the bollocks I've seen so far, playing Jesus Christ RPG is just like when you're starving and you finally get your food at a restaurant. And to make things even better, this game is actually a trilogy. Yeah, three RPGs in one. Rise Jesus Christ RPG is more of the exact same, so I won't say anything about it. But what about baby Jesus Christ RPG? What could this one be like? We get some intro text talking about the angel Gabriel coming down to see Mary for a bit of the old in-out, in-out, and she's not very happy about it. So Gabriel tells Mary that she'll be pregnant with the son of God despite her being a virgin, and her face sums it all up. And then, as if by magic, with the tiniest tap of the space bar... <laughs> The main problem with this though is that I went out of the town to try and explore when all of a sudden I was jumped by a desert thief and Mary was surprised. So surprised she died in one hit. Game over. And here's baby Jesus about to be stabbed. Sitting in a big poo. Fine then, I'll stock up on some weapons before I leave. Hello there, poor starving child. I don't have any food, but did you know the only food you need is the word of Jesus Christ? I'll buy something off of you. Um... Battle saw? Perfect! Oh look, it's Joseph. Time to go to Bethlehem and give birth to our bastard child. Oh no! A tourist appeared and called us... <laughs> Kill Billy's from Nazareth. I guess now we have no choice but to kill him with our battle saw. And luckily, Joseph joined our party pre-equipped with a giant battle hammer. We look around all of the inns to stay for the night, and sadly, there's nowhere to go. I can see where this is going. Time for us to have a perfectly normal and natural birth in a cow pack. We find the right stable we need, walk in the door, and then immediately there's Jesus. Boy, that was quick. Okay, then time to move on to the next game I found. Oh look, it's more cars. But now it's all about Mater. Who asked for this? The first thing you see in this game is Mater himself with his face right up to the camera and his tongue sticking out. Remind me why anybody asked for this game? Oh, don't worry, I know. <laughs> You want to know about this game? I'll tell you. It's Cars 1 again. Yes, I'm not pulling your jammies. This is the same bloody game as Cars 1, all the way down to the bony little finger. Same hub world, same objective markers, same races, same collectibles, except now we have missing sound effects for some reason. Disney, where dreams come true. The only things I can give Mater National some credit for are that firstly, you don't really play as Mater, so why do you have to scare me like that? And secondly, the controls and physics are a little bit better than the first game. You actually slip and slide around the dirt like a rally car this time, and the power slide actually makes you drift a little bit. There's a pretty useful tight turning button, there's more mini games, there's a recharging boost system, and the map actually shows you what events are around you and which ones you've already completed. However, this is still pretty mindless stuff. You race on identical tracks over and over again with barely any different stipulations, and if there's anyone out there who knows how to do the best single lap around everyone in town, it's Trollope. I'm a little bit concerned at all the adverts in this game though. Shifty drug? What the hell do you think they sell there? Do you think they would help me leak less? Okay, yeah, I think I'm just about done here. I'm gonna move on to the next game. Oh, oh my god, I'm a monster truck. This is horrifying. What madman put this in the game? Okay, in all seriousness, we're done now. Not because there's no more games of cars, there's plenty of them, but I'm just sick of looking at all of them at this point. Moving on to Shrek again, but this time on the GameCube, here is Shrek Super Slam. Oh no, Shrek. Please don't slam me in my soup. The game begins with Donkey trying desperately to get his dragon donkey hybrid offspring to sleep, which immediately makes me remember that they somehow did it, so I take the game out and throw it in the bin. After that, we see Shrek reading some bedtime stories to try getting the kids to sleep, and then cut to a story of Puss in Boots going to the bar and asking for some milk. You then discover that this is, in the simplest of terms, 3D Smash Brothers. You spend all of the matches mixing light and strong attacks together, grabbing and throwing opponents, picking up weapons, and guarding into dodge rolls. And for a little difference to Smash Bros, you have to land successful hits to build up a Smash meter, which, when full, gives you a limited time to activate a unique Smash attack for each character. For each person you hit, you get a point, and if you get hit by someone else's Smash attack, you lose a point. Yes, believe it or not, this is actually a mechanic that PS All Stars tried to do, but if you ask me, it did it worse. Move aside, Kratos, Gingerbread Man has the better game. Instead of collecting Smash attack orbs from beat up players and then losing your own orbs if you get beat up yourself, meaning that you could go back and forth for hours before 
before anybody gets a single point. This game just lets you focus on landing hits and avoiding hits in a fast paced race to see how many times you can build up your smash meter and get a point by hitting the opponent. It's very simple, to the point, easy to pick up, the chaos that unfolds whenever you smash other players can be extremely enjoyable. There's tons of different challenges to complete to unlock new characters for the multiplayer, including Humpty Dumpty with the greatest idle animation of all time. And since there's no singular plot to go through with one narrative, the story mode has some genuinely entertaining scenarios for all the fights, just because they make them up as they go along. I played this game for hours when I was 11 on the PS2, and I can totally understand why. It's a decent game. But yeah, the story mode? Unless you want to play something so easy that it makes you feel like a fetus, I wouldn't bother. So how about we take a look at another game that was deemed so controversial it never even made it to the UK. Like the guy game. This is... This is no. Why, hello there, ladies. You look... clean. Hang on, this is the guy game. Where's the men? The guy game is a game all about answering trivia questions. Yeah, you didn't see that coming, did you? Look, just because guys may be slobbering lust monsters doesn't mean we aren't smart, and the guy game is here to truly test your knowledge in all the right ways. With boob! The guy game is what happens when a load of morons go to spring break with a few cameras, a few microphones, and then coax a load of bimbos that stink of regret into playing a game where if they get an answer to a trivia question wrong, they suffer the indignity of exposing themselves to a man-sized ferret. But don't worry, if you get a question wrong, you don't need to expose anything. Well, you could have told me earlier! The guy game is aimed squarely at testosterone-laden college students, spring breakers, and, well, any red-blooded American guy. This is a man's game for grown-up manly many men manly men. Couldn't you tell from this manly face on the front cover? Doesn't that get you in the mood to see some girls? You bring the party and we'll supply the game. You'll score every time. Oh yeah, I feel like I'm really scoring right now. Alone, in the dark, in my pants, playing PlayStation 2. How's your game? Well, I'm playing a video game instead of seeing real women, so my game is just dandy. I don't know about you lot, but I can't wait to see the assets of Press, VP, Tress, and A-Hole. So let's boot the game up. <laughs> After everything we've seen so far, even the word loading is nasty. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm having a right load. Here's the intro FMV cutscene, letting us know what the hell we're getting ourselves into. Oh god, please no. Please don't tell me that this game has commentary. From this hog. Well, I think it would be downright rude to start the game without meeting the babes first, so let's check out some of the people we'll be looking at today. Ramona. What do you look for in a man? His jugular vein. Okay! Zoe, ultimate dream? To be able to jog without pain. Now, now that's a woman we can all aspire to be. Simone, I lost my virginity, but I still have the box it came in. Awesome, can you ship it over to me? Oh, wow. I didn't know that Ronald Reagan was a double D cup. Unfortunately, though, this is probably the best of the talent we're going to be seeing because the rest of the women here... I'm attracted to short guys because they like me. What do you look for in a man? Tall. Aren't very bright. Uh, maybe I'm being too harsh. So let's go to the behind the scenes photos and see if there's any more intelligent people lurking in there. Ha! My name is Sticky. And to start with, we only have one episode, but that's not a big deal. Uh, oh, okay. We also need a profile name and... <laughs> <laughs> Big Daddy was the default, so I'm gonna change it only a tiny bit. Perfect. The rules of this trivia game are very simple. Don't bother getting any questions right because it doesn't matter. Instead, if you want to get anywhere in this game and unlock further episodes, that's entirely down to how well you can randomly guess if the brazen hussy you're talking to will be able to get the same question right or wrong. Or if you're feeling extra dangerous, you'll need to guess what wrong answer they will give in the special round of titwits. If you guess wrong too many times, this woman appears and berates you. What's wrong with you? Don't you want to see titties? But the more times you guess correctly, the more you add to the patented Flashometer. Level 1 is soft and squishy where everything gets censored with a guy game logo, meaning some poor soul had to keyframe animate this logo on top of every single woman. Luckily, I don't mind boobs, but the guy game logo? <laughs> <laughs> Level 2 is sorta chubby, which if I ever hear a dong described as that again, I'll cut it off. And that's when the women end up going from logo censoring to pixelation. Mmm. Squares! Capping this off is level 3, super stiff, where the censoring is totally gone. Oh, and by the way, every time you move the flashometer along, it comes. If all of this gets a little bit too much, you know, like, if you can't handle the unbridled sex 
messiness going on, it's okay, because you can quit the game whenever you want with the hottie bagger. <laughs> This game is terrible. A quiz game is nothing without a good host, though, and the guy game doesn't disappoint with Matt Sadler. I'm training to be an RN. Training to be an RN, a nurse. Yeah, how about you? Same thing. <laughs> I'm picturing the two of you in nurses' outfits as we speak, so it's great. Awesome. He's delightful. Although our side commentators, Steve and Dick. A college student who's working as a waitress. When you ask her for food, she brings it to you. I'll definitely a close second. Okay, I'll do my best not to give you a hard one. <laughs> But I gotta tell you, I got a hard one. Mm. Stephanie is now causing problems with my shorts. If anything, I think there's only one missing piece that would complete this puzzle and make the game perfect. PS2 buzz controllers. One, two, three. Which is the birthplace of the King of Pants? Oh, and by the way, when I started this match, I made sure the balls were turned on. So yeah. When can we see the map? And at this point, I don't even know if the flashometer is how uncensored you're able to make the game or how much blood you're able to add to Matt Sadler's face because the further you get, he just gets redder and redder. He's like a ripening little strawberry. He looks like he's about to burst. Has he not seen a woman before? You want to know the sleaziest part of all of this, though? This red-faced pomegranate getting all worked up and sweaty, gawking over all of these 18-year-old college women is 32. And just so I'm clear, the age gap isn't the problem. I just find it really funny to think that this guy has had such bad luck with women for over a decade of his adult life that the only way he's able to see jugs is by setting up a PS2 trivia game with questions about Miles Davis, Monopoly, Particle Science, and Star Trek. He knows these ladies are gonna get them all wrong. He knows that means he'll see them all. And he loves it. Or maybe he doesn't because at the end of it, he only ends up a semi-flaccid. I'm on a mission in this round. Uh-oh. I'm gonna see him. Hey, you wanna know what really gets me going? Schindler's List. Oh look, it's a game about throwing balls into a load of targets for four minutes straight. You know, what every hot-blooded American guy loves to do in the middle of their happy time. If I have a match with somebody on Tinder, I want to see if they can score more than 402,000 on bulls shots. I want to know they're worthy enough for my body. Uh, elephant eggs are really big. Okay, so these women may be thick, but at the very least, they were all here of their own consent and were all of perfectly legal age. 19, 20, 23, 20, 20, 19, 17. Yeah! So as it turns out, this game was not only never released anywhere else in the world other than the States for its content, but it was eventually taken off the shelves entirely because one girl in one of the very final episodes of the game was allegedly under legal age when she decided to throw herself on camera. I am holding a disc that contains... Speaking of bicycles, that's reminded me of a Lego character that doesn't ride one. Pepperoni? With the skateboard? Lego Island? I couldn't grab myself a copy of the original Lego Island and get it working on a new PC in time for this video, but rest assured, I remember the original Lego Island on PC, and I remember spending hours on it clicking away on our Microsoft Space Helmet, and then we ended up getting Lego Chess, Lego Loco, and Lego Creator, with those incredible Lego spines on the case that you could clunk together. I mean, the cases were made of Lego. They were fun before you even played the game. For being the first ever internationally released Lego game for the masses, however, Lego Island 1 had it all. A giant world to explore that you felt like you were a part of, lots of customization to get your imagination flowing. Sure, it hasn't aged very well. I mean, it's a little bit chunky, but it is still a harmless and enjoyable little nostalgic trip. Trek 1 for the Xbox. What's that? The game doesn't work? Oh, that's a shame. What was that? They remade it for the GameCube. Everything about this box art makes me want to vomit. I don't like this man's face. I don't like the eggs with mouths. I don't like Shrek's single pointy tooth. And I especially don't like the close up on the back. Did anybody really need to be so close to Shrek that they could see his greasy sausage fingerprints? Even the title is revolting. Shrek extra large? Shrek's extra large what? Oh, wow. Oh, just, just, just wow. What a lovely menu. Aren't you glad they remade the original Xbox exclusive for the GameCube so that more console owners could see what they were missing out on? I guess all we can do here is hit start then. Hey Siri. Cut the cord. What's my name? Uh, Voof. Oh, I am so happy with my career choices right now. And those burps being used as selection noises? best part of the game. Oh, you think I'm joking? Fine, here it is. Take a look for yourself.
Yes, this silent void of unhappiness with 1996 PC textures, no sound at all, and a frame rate as smooth as sandpaper is Shrek Extra Large on the GameCube, with the golden Nintendo seal of quality. I want to let each move Shrek has in this game shine by itself, because goddammit, nothing else is shining right now. The analog stick lets you run, and Shrek runs around as gracefully as an angry honey badger. The B button makes you kick, and someone decided that the sound effect for the kick should play over and over again even if you aren't kicking anything. The R trigger lets you do this, and that speaks for itself. But the best button the game has to work with is the Z button, because pressing that makes the camera go- <laughs> What eldritch horror have I been blessed with here? He looks like a toddler who stole a camera phone and a knife. This... This is what she sees. I swear this is the best bit of the game by far. Zooming in the camera and locking it in place makes this already hideous game look like a Picasso painting if he sniffed glue before painting it. Hello? 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 Just lock that camera in and press anything. I guarantee it will give you more fun than anything else this game has to offer you. No, I'm not playing this game any further than level one. Why should I? If a video game greets me with earwax, burping selection noises, and then follows up with Shrek's inside out butthole, I'm not gonna humor it. Another Cars game. It takes more than speed to become the ultimate racer. It also takes crack. So this game is the most modern that we have today. It's on the PS4 and starts with a TV show called Chicks Picks with Chick Hicks Dicks, where we get called out live on air to challenge another race car. And so, because we're live, we've got to accept it, otherwise we'll look like a puss. So naturally, in order for us to win against this guy, I'm going to pick Guido. And I kid you not, Cars 3 is the same game as Cars 2, but just better. How is Cars of all the Pixar franchises doing this? It's almost like these bad movies about multiple cars were made as an excuse only to make merchandise. And 12 year old me agrees. In Cars 3 you've got the same power up, same good control, same stunts, same weapons and same turbo system. But now with loads more tracks that are way more visually varied, so many more types of race and a much faster pace that allows you to pick the next event you want to do in a drop down menu after each race instead of loading back to a main menu after every single one. Being on the PS4 it also looks pretty damn gorgeous to be honest. It runs smoother than the other games and I mean you can even customise the colours and accessories for the car you pick. I'm absolutely gobsmacked. Smacked. The music is mostly filler background noise to be fair, but other than that, this is a bona fide keeper. Even the track design is great, since there's like a million different ways to go, routes to take, shortcuts to discover, and because of that, it makes the computer players an actual challenge, even on normal difficulty. I nearly lost plenty of races because of the added challenge here. I'm amazed, I've got to be honest. So enough gaggling, let's get on with this, shall we? I think we should start by checking out the first thing that you see when you start the thing up. The Xbox dashboard. So here I am in the main Xbox 360 dashboard menu. Say hello. Oh, look at that. It actually, you know what? I'm gonna give Xbox credit here. This works surprisingly well. It knows exactly where my body is. You'll need a controller. Why? I'm using Kinect. Isn't the whole point that I don't need a controller? Anyway, as I was saying, it knows where my body is, it knows which hand I'm pointing towards the screen and which direction they're being pointed in. It's incredibly responsive. It knows when I'm swiping and in what direction I'm swiping in. Like, there's no... Okay, that went wrong. But overall, it's surprisingly good, you know? It works. So, um, let's try out the best game to demonstrate the power of this thing. Um, Raving Rabbids. Yes, what game couldn't be better at showing off what the Kinect can do other than... Raving rabbits. Don't know what these things are? Then I want to open your head and live inside you, warm and happy, not knowing anything about them either. Rabbits are coming to life. Everybody run. I've got a question for you. Who doesn't love the rabbits? I don't even think kids like them, which is very lucky because this game begins with you needing to smack one upside the head in order to start it. We then see a cutscene where a man is on the phone. Mm -hmm talking with a goose, and then he suddenly throws his phone in the bin, which falls down a series of tubes and alongside a rabbit in an acid bath, the only place where it belongs. Then another one comes in and eats the phone, and then another one looks at a screen, and another one gets stuck in a door. Is this funny? Am I supposed to be laughing? Because I'm not laughing, I'm skipping. Off to the main menu, and I got an achievement. But you don't get an achievement for putting your hands up! You get shot! Now, I don't think I should mess with any options here that require more than one player, so I'll stick with quick play for now. After a loading screen, we end up on a game where we need to suck up all of the spaghetti sauce, meaning that we need to lean our head left and right to catch it all, and that's it. Oh. Okay then. I didn't even manage to do it that well. <laughs> nice try. Here, have some toilet paper. 
Oh, and while you're here, have a picture of you standing wonky. Oh. After this is another loading screen and we're thrown into another game. Raise our hand to choose an answer. We have to count the fake moving sheep, pick the correct answer, and that's it. After this, we're thrown into another game. Spin a pickle jar lid as fast as possible, and that's it. So that's all this is. A load of 10 second mini games back to back with no point. Yes, yes it is. Well, I don't like that. Not even kidding, that is all this game is. Slowly moving from one tiny minigame to the next while being shown pictures of how much fun you're having. It's like if WarioWare let you play one game per minute. In fact, you are in loading screens for more time than actually playing the games that are loading. And after all the waiting, you're rewarded with a game that tells you that rabbits like shoving Barbies up their holes. Oh, what's that? You've got another picture for me? Great. Perfect. I look like a lamp. I mean, I can't say that the game doesn't work, because it does, but there's absolutely no reason to bother playing it if you're alone. It's just one tiny minigame after the other with no rhyme or reason. It's kind of sad, actually. Which is why they included a minigame that lets you play with your very own rabbit to pretend that you have a friend. Hey. What's the point of this game? What am I doing? <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Why is it not working? Why Why are you half a bunny? Okay, doesn't matter, he's gone. Oh no, okay. He's now the sofa. I'm going to sit on him. Oh, he liked that. Now he's leaving. So, um, this is, this is a great mode, everybody. This is why you want to connect, so that you can have a fake... Ra I didn't mean to do that, but I'm glad it happened. So I can kick the thing, that's good to know. I can't kick the thing, that's good to know. Say, what do you want to be when you grow up? An astronaut? Great! <laughs> A little slap will surely make him change his mind. Change his mind about what? Women's rights? Ah, oh, that's fun. Ah, oh, that's fun. This is shit. Well, obviously, that was some pretty low-hanging fruit, wasn't it? I also did do a video on Crash Bash, but that was back in 2012. That was even before YouTube was taken over by Susan Wetwinky. And because that video is... <laughs> ...terrible, I figured I'd drop myself into this video nice and gently and revisit Crash Bash to see if it really was the beginning of Crash's downfall after Naughty Dog dropped in to start making games about angry, hairy men. So I guess it's time to conclude this year's Bandicoot Month by acknowledging all of Crash's failures and getting them out of the way forever so that I never have to mention them again. These games I'll be talking about today have been heavily requested on my channel for years now, so sorry for the wait. I hope this is what you wanted. Oh wow, check it out. It's Crash and Basham. I reviewed this game when I was a clean-shaven child. The graphics as well are actually quite pleasant. The characters look good, and I don't know what I was talking about. This was the first Crash game to be picked up by another random developer after Naughty Dog lost the rights of the character to Universal, and that does spell bad news at the offset, but at least the new devs, Eurocom, didn't try to poorly replicate the original formula. They instead tried to do a Mario Party, but with a gorilla with an anus for a face. Doesn't mean the game is great though, despite it doing its own thing, because, spoiler warning, I don't think it's that great. Can we judge the game by the first world of adventure? No. We can't. Ignore him. Now even though Crashly Bashly is a party game, if you're all by yourself, you can indeed play a single player adventure mode. Ooh, get you. And in adventure mode, I decided to pick Cortex because when he's running, his hands turn into a canary. But you can't call this an adventure without a story. I mean, what do you think this game is? Hiking. So the intro cutscene clues us in on what's going on. In the most basic of terms, Aku Aku and Uka Uka are having an argument, which almost leads to the worst boxing match of all time because none of them have any arms. Prepare to fight. No, Uka Uka. The ancients would not allow it. Ah, do you know what? Aku Aku is right. Yeah, we've never done that before at all. No, we don't fight because the ancients won't let them do it. No, not even once. Don't want to piss off those ancients. You know what's even weirder about this, though? The first line spoken in this cutscene is... How many times must you be told? You cannot defeat me. So why does Uka Uka even try to fight Aku Aku after all of that? Why give him the ancient's excuse? You both can't hurt each other. Aku Aku said so. Do you have memory loss, Uka Uka? Can Wood get Alzheimer's? Anyway, after this, Aku Aku has had enough and is about to bring the thunder. This bickering can go on no longer. Or he's gonna sound like a fed up mother. And logically, just like when you catch your own kids bickering, there's only one way to settle it. Illegal cage fighting! Yes, instead of settling this tiny squabble between themselves, these omnipotent and all-powerful masks decide to steal their supposed friends and pit them against each other until only one is left alive. And Crash is A-OK -okay with it. What is he doing? And so, by winning a random set of battle party games and fighting boss levels at the end of each warp room, your chosen character must beat out the competition for the glory of their own mask that forced them into this horror, and this somehow proves how great they are and who wins this pissy little argument. Even stranger, though, is that since I picked Cortex, 
Apex, I'm fighting for the evil side, and yet the boss levels are all the same if you picked the hero side. Even Uka Uka says in the boss cutscenes, You must first meet an old friend. So if they're old friends, why are we fighting the bosses? If the bosses are evil and friends with Uka Uka, including the final boss, doesn't that mean that the evil side already wins this argument by default? What's going on? Why are we fighting them? This story is a total disaster, no other words. It's as much of a mess as Tiny Tiger's character model. Cortex's hair though is on point. Look at it. It's so on point that it is a point. His hair is so sharp he could open an envelope with it. So Crash to Coot Bash to Coot, like I mentioned earlier, is Mario Party for the entirety of the gameplay, but without the game board or dice to roll, and it's worse. You just win mini games over and over again to progress. And where some of these games on their own are totally passable and fun in their own right, where Crash Bash fails is with the tedium of it all. This is one of the most repetitive games I've ever played. In fact, it's so repetitive that in the first warp room, you get four-way pong, polar bear fighting, pogo stick bouncing, and 3D brawling. And then in the second warp room, you get four-way pong, polar bear fighting, pogo stick bouncing, and 3D brawling. Foon! Sure, there's an additional game mechanic added in for the copies, but they're still copies. They feel exactly the same to play. And many of these minigames are copied up to three times throughout the adventure mode in different warp rooms, with nothing but a different coat of paint. And that's not all. Get this. In order to unlock the boss battles from each warp room, you need a certain amount of trophies. And no, your wife doesn't count. To get the trophy on one of these levels, you need to win the minigame in question, not once, not twice, but three times. And this isn't a best out of three system or anything like that. The game keeps on going until anybody in the match wins three times. Meaning that you could potentially replay the level nine times in a row in order to win just one trophy. And that's assuming you even win on the ninth attempt. So you get the four trophies from Warp Room 1, unlock Boss 1, and then think to yourself, God damn, I can't wait to see something new. Warp Room 2 has exactly the same minigame style as you just did, aside from one extra level you haven't seen before, and you still need to win them all three times each and then all of a sudden boss 2 won't let you in because you need trophies gems and crystals to get inside but where do you get the gems and crystals from you bitch why by going back through all the levels you've already replayed a million times over and replaying them again but this time with an overly frustrating crutch like randomly growing insta kill mushrooms taking over the stage or you beginning the stage with less health than everybody else yes engine this is a great idea when two giant missile equipped mech suits can't take down a tiny bandicoot, just spin around and spit balls out of your mouth, I'll get them. So yeah, the single player adventure mode, aside from the decent bosses, it's pretty horrendous. And unfortunately, unless you own a first edition black labeled European version of Crash Bash, like I do, there's no code you can put in anywhere to unlock all of the multiplayer games straight away if you want to just jump into a match with a few friends. You have to go through the adventure mode and unlock everything in that tedious goddamn way. Otherwise, you're stuck with four minigames total with four different skins, and that is it. Unless you have a copy of Spyro 3. Yes, stay with me. By holding L1 and R2 on the title screen for Spyro 3 and pressing square, you get access to a hidden Crash Bash demo. And then, if you type in a specific code on the title screen of the demo, you are then granted access to a cheat menu, where you can not only manipulate and change basically everything on the screen, but also have access to nearly every single level, fully multiplayer compatible and all. You are missing a few of the final mini games, and you only have three bosses to pick from, boss three of which apparently being Homer Simpson. <laughs> But yes, essentially, nearly the entire Crash Bash game is hidden on a Spyro 3 disc. Which I guess just goes to show you how little space Crash Bash's full disc was using in the first place. I can't believe they left this here accidentally. It's so damn cool. Look, you can even see the exact date and time that this beta build of the game was placed onto the Spyro 3 disc. How adorable. Okay, what I just said about the no effort thing, that was harsh. There is quite a bit of effort put into some of Crash Bash. The soundtrack, for instance, is one of Crash's best on the PS1. In fact, below Crash 2, I'd say it was the second best, so go and check it out. And when you do have all the mini games unlocked, it is a decent distraction with friends, but getting to that point legitimately, which the majority of players of this game had to do, is hellish. Too many freeze frames I was able to grab from this game were absolutely horrifying and a far cry from the detail you'd expect from the Crash universe, even on the PS1. And come on, man, Cortex's head here looks like a boiled egg on top of a frisbee. I can see a good game here. It's not in there. So do you want to know how to ruin somebody's day in two steps? It's easy. Step one, give them Shrek Treasure Hunt on PS1. And step two, remind them about Blue Waffle. Right off the bat, I'm not exactly a fan of Fiona's face right here. She looks like she just realized who she shares a bed with. Oh, 
Hey, no, 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 get out of there, Tomb Raider. Shrek's got some treasure to find. Okay, so as it turns out, the person I eBayed this game from didn't look after the disc very well. I don't know why. But because of that, all the cutscenes are a little bit... <laughs> Terrible. It's okay though because we can still get to the menus and judging by this music It sounds like we're off to Shrek's funeral. Maybe the intro cutscene won't be as balked as the other ones though I feel optimistic. So what's the story here? Princess Fiona arrived. Oh She did and you know what the funeral procession song at the start menu was fitting because this <laughs> game is dead on arrival My lord this frame rate is this a video game or a book? I'm stunned that this looks and runs as poor as it does for a PS1 game released in 2002 But that doesn't matter because I've got 10 blocks of cheese to find this then unlocks a room for me to go into in order to play a mini game And the name of this mini game is purgatory because it never actually loaded and this drowning bug in the corner was left to slowly die in its own filth forever voila Oh, we're in and aren't I glad I finally got it working no because this game is my armpit. Shrek for the PS1 is a weird platforming party game hybrid where in the platforming moments you can run and jump no that's it enemy coming your way tough luck sunshine you can't attack back but then again they can't really hurt you either they just kind of knock you to the floor what's the point of any of these sections I really don't know you collect items to unlock more mini games but since the item collecting part is a smelly pit of nothing where you can't do anything and take so long to collect anything it might as well just be a level select and I'd rather it be a level select because this part of the game is as appealing as soap scum even if you took this part of the game away though it ultimately doesn't matter the mini games you unlock are at best unimaginable imaginative and at worst totally wretched from copying simple button presses to moving your cursor over to a ripple in the water to catch fish and reel them in very slowly nine times this is one of the worst games I've ever played and I'm not even exaggerating just to give you an idea how unenjoyable this whole package is you could spend up to 15 minutes wandering aimlessly around this jittery wasteland with no obstacles to avoid looking for random items only to unlock a terrible mini game that lasts all of 20 seconds and then you're back at the slideshow again but at least there's a button you can hold to walk in case the whole thing wasn't moving slowly enough for you or you could do exactly the same thing and then be treated to a mini game that lasts yet another 15 minutes not because it's deep or fun but because it just doesn't get to the point oh look shrek has something to tell me what's that oh great this frame rate is making me ill i can't be the only one getting eye ache here can i why did they release this in the state that it's in and why do the lily pads in the water look like floating kidneys and hey while we're on the subject of disney uh, <laughs> Yeah, did you forget that Disney owned The Simpsons? I forget that at least once every two days. But I'll never forget the first time I played Simpsons skateboarding on the PS2. Yes, once again, I'm revisiting another game from the vaults of my old horrible reviews. Like a cockroach after a nuke, my past always comes back to make me itch. What's this? No memory card. Oh, what a shame. I guess that means I can't play the game anymore. So thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. I'll see you on the next Kanekura show, same time next week, where I'll be stomping on a kitten live on camera. Well, hey, look at that. The first thing I see in this game is something that makes absolutely no sense. And the sad thing is that this still makes more sense than anything else you're about to see. The intro to this game is quite simply hideous. One of the worst I've ever seen. It's just a barrage of colors and an onslaught of ugly edits enough to give you a seizure or make you feel like you're dying from leprosy. I mean, Look at this, come on. They couldn't even cut out the white in between Bart's armpit. And then after possibly the worst intro of all time, you get greeted to one of the worst opening themes of all time that either sounds like your CD is scratched or you're having convulsions. <laughs> After this, well, this screenshot here should tell you all you need to know about the level of quality we're dealing with. Marge looking like a squid, and Homer looking like a weak old can of spam. This is easily one of the ugliest PS2 games ever made from the starting gate, and then you actually get going and think to yourself, oh, you know, maybe I should try doing some tricks on the ground right now, like in every skateboarding game ever made, but oh no, you can't. Oh no! No joke, if you try to do something as simple as a kickflip, 75% of the time it won't work, and you'll be eating some grass-covered dindin instead. Once again, you've got to push yourself along with a forward push without automatic acceleration from holding down your ollie button, taking all the flow and momentum out of the gameplay, but I'd be able to get my head around this if the game let me push my board up slightly steep slopes, or let me get out of half-pipe bowls that I can't escape from. But you can't. This then compounds with an absolutely pathetic ollie that sometimes flies you up to space, and other times barely leaves the ground, meaning that you won't clear gaps, and sometimes you'll just accelerate from zero to piss off in half a second. Absolutely nothing works in this 
game. It's actually a miracle how broken it is, as well as ugly. I mean, you look at that and tell me that's a person. That's not a person. It's a mound of beef. Don't forget the overly sensitive balance meter either. <laughs> Or the fact that you have running commentary from your character and Kent Brockman throughout the entire game and none of them ever shut up. Oh no! Kick flip! <laughs> Come it! Tailed Papaya. radical! Hey. Very well done! Ah. Well done! Sure, you could always argue that all these different characters have different stats that are better for different kinds of skateboarding tricks, but what I'm gonna say in response to that is that Tony Hawk also has that system, but you're not absolutely incompetent at the start of the game. You can still do things, even if not as good as you will be able to later, but here, you can't do anything. I mean, look at this, most of the time you can't even grind anyway, and instead have the rail stick itself through your head. Personally though, I didn't do much else, because I decided to give up after I got decked in the head by a car. This is absolutely categorically definitive garbage. The Bubsy 3D of sports games, probably one of the worst ever made. Sure, Phoenix Games had this abomination five years after Simpsons Skateboarding, but that's Phoenix Games. They probably put a blank disc into a sandwich toaster and then said, Game's done! But considering this is The Simpsons and sold at a much higher price than a Phoenix game ever would, I'm shocked that no one seemed to care if this game even worked. I don't know how anybody in the dev team tested this and thought it was passable. It's borderline impossible to play. It's not even so bad, it's good. I don't feel any misguided passion or overinflated egos behind the creation of this, all I feel is the bitterness of an entire team who didn't want to make this. Considering it was aimed at kids as well who probably didn't know or care who a Tony Hawk was, it's probably the most cynical cash grab ever made for a licensed game. It copies the Tony Hawk level design, Tony Hawk game structure, Tony Hawk mission style, and even Tony Hawk button layout, but butchers every other element up so magnificently it makes me question why they didn't just do a full-blown rip-off of Tony Hawk entirely. Sure, it would have been unoriginal, but it would have been a good game. Look at this, if you even somehow manage to win a single thing in this game, all that satisfaction and frustration is spat back in your face as you only make 10 cents for it. Are you telling me that I'm going through all of this toss for a grand prize of $99? Are you insane? I use that kind of money to blow my nose and wipe it on homeless people, and you're expecting me to nearly die for that? $99? Shred Springfield? With pleasure. So, what do you do when you have too many characters to work with? You stick them all in a kart racer, what else? Look, you get to play as all of your favourite characters like Marty, Alex, Shrek, Donkey, and- <laughs> And you had better make sure to spell carts with a Z. So I'm picking the only circuit race that's available to me, all good there. And which character should I be? Hiccup, Skipper, Donkey, Bob, Alex, or Shrek, who can barely fit in his own cart with his knees nobbling out and doesn't even look like he wants to be here. Do you want to know what playing DreamWorks Superstar Kart is like? Very simple. It's Mario Kart, but not fun. The drifting feels terrible, like you're spreading butter on a lumpy bit of bread. And the turning feels as restrictive as anything. I mean, I can forgive a lot of unoriginality in a kart racer, but if the core of the game, the driving, doesn't even feel vaguely fun, what's the point in playing it? Am I driving go-karts or cutting paper? with blunt scissors. This is horrible. Oh, and by the way, I just unlocked Toothless. Look at the state of this. Just look at the state of this. Why was this put here? Who greenlit this idea? Why does Toothless look like a long black sausage? And why does he sound like that time you heard your neighbours going at it through the wall? <laughs> This here is 150cc. This is the fastest that DreamWorks Superstar Card will let you go. I thought 150cc stood for your engine power, not 150 crappy crebs. Now, can I say the same thing about the sequel on the PS1, Lego Island 2, The Brickster's Revenge? Ages 6 to 99. Ah, sorry, Grandma. We start the game off and we're given a loading disc that's also a pizza. Hmm. Oh boy, look at this. We are in for a bricky pricky treat here, aren't we? These are easily the laziest cutscenes I've ever seen. It's just two images flipping back and forth between this guy, the infomaniac, and everyone's favourite dude with the food who has only seemed to deliver pizzas in the 23 years he's existed, Pepperoni. Oh no! Is he... Is he bleeding? Our first task of the game is to deliver pizzas across the whole island in exchange for Lego bricks to build a house. Shh. Don't tell them that's an awful deal, I'm ripping these suckers off. And what an intro to the residence this mission is, because I don't think I've ever seen such an undeserving bunch of creeps in my life. 
This guy looks like he's had too many lemons, and this lady here thanks me for the pizza with a head bar. This doctor over here tells this preteen straight to his face that he looks good, and this guy can't help himself from sucking on my face. Pepper, cool. <laughs> What is wrong with this island? Here's some bricks. Oh, and by the way, I don't know how this lighting engine is being handled, but whatever it is, it's terrible. As I gaze out into the endless waters, I think to myself, is Pepper standing behind a fence? Or is Pepper actually the fence? This place is downright unhinged. I gave this dude a delicious pizza earlier, and then I later find him squatting outside a stranger's house eating the floor. But all of these slightly demented moments in this game aren't enough of a distraction from how dull it is. I've been running around the island for about 20 minutes so far with no clue where I'm going, where to deliver pizzas, or where to find my remaining house bricks. The screen size is way too small for the scale of this island. There's no map feature at all, and by complete accident, I ended up talking to a local twice in a row with the second conversation ending with the guy pointing in the completely wrong direction to where I was standing. Funnily enough though, I thought this was a bug or something until I unintentionally figured out that every character does this and it turns out that they're actually just pointing towards where my next objective is. Can't you just point at the same time? I mean, that's all your bloody arms can do, Lego. But do you know what else this means? It means that out of everybody on this entire island, the only person that has absolutely no sodding clue what's going on is your main character, Pepperoni. Our hero, ladies and gents. It wasn't until a total of 30 minutes on the first mission that I then found my final stop, the pizzeria, which was hidden behind a dump load of hills. The only restaurant in town, and you can't even get to it without a degree in mountaineering. Time to go and collect my final brick then. So after all of this, I finally get my last brick and go back to my house to finish building it. And then I get a phone call telling me to go back to the pizzeria hidden in the hills that I just came from. Also that I can pick up one last pizza delivery and give it to a criminal. This is the Brickster, and by the way, in the first Lego Island, he escaped jail by using a pizza. So guess what happens here? He escapes jail by using a pizza. Even worse, everybody just watches him leave, including the police. Hey! Yeah, Pepper, you tell him. After escaping, the Brickster then heads to the center of information, intelligence, and life itself on the entire island, and just strolls inside to steal a book that allows him to summon anything out of thin air. Lego Island doesn't deserve to be saved. Throughout this entire process, nobody chases him, nobody stops him, nobody even shouts at him, and in fact, after he's got total control, they end up having a nice long chat while he's standing on a roof. But it's all up to Pepper to catch the Brickster and save the day. You know, not these guys. Pepper, what are you doing? My best. <laughs> he hasn't even got a body. So now the island has been taken over by the evil Brickster bots, and I've got to be honest, they do sound pretty scary. What are they going to do to us? How are we going to catch them? Once again, we're thrown into a mission where we've got to search around this unnecessarily large island with nothing else going on except for finding a load of coloured Brickster bots to capture, which you can never find because they move around all the time, and the draw distance is so pitiful, you'll never figure out which direction you should be going in order to figure out where they ran off to. And once more, if you're totally lost, you can just ask any other resident on this godforsaken rock to point you in the right direction, meaning that even with the location of criminals, everybody knows what's going on aside from Pepper. This ugly troglodyte who can't even stand up straight is our hero. None of these people who actually know what's going on and could just walk over to the collectibles are doing anything. No, let's leave it up to the kid who has a skateboard that is somehow slower than his run. The kid who can't jump over knee-high fences, but then sometimes he can. The kid who doesn't walk up paths and instead elevates himself up them. The kid who is allowed to pilot a helicopter but can't land it wherever he wants, so what's the point of using it? The kid who gave the main antagonist the keys to get out of his cell and nearly destroy the island all over again. I'm starting to lose it. I'm going to hide away in my beach of madness. The only, and I mean the only good thing I can talk about with this game so far is that for a 2001 PS1 title, the analog stick controls are some of the best I've ever used on the system. They're incredibly responsive to pressure, you can run freely in any direction, not just eight, and the camera controls on the right stick wouldn't be out of place in a first person shooter nowadays. I'm really impressed considering the technology they had to work with. I know it came out earlier, but Quake 2 on PS1 would have worked way better with this setup. So well done Lego Island 2, you're better than Quake. Anyway, after a literal hour of me doing nothing but walking around aimlessly, I finally get rewarded 
with a shitty little mini game where you just press the correct button to knock the Brixter bots back down into Lego Island's central computer. My best! Wait, if they're inside this computer and messing it all up, why are we smacking them back in? My god, who cares? I've got a boat now, so it's on to a new world, and hopefully there's something more fun to do this time. Ooh, a medieval island. This is pretty cool. I suppose this can only mean that we get access to another slow and boring mini game of collecting stuff. Oh, wow. Now I have a drug horse that I can't control anywhere for the life of me. What's wrong with this thing? Do I need to take it out back and shoot it in the head? Oh, look, it's another mini game. It's jousting, but with button mashing and awkward aiming that doesn't bloody work. I am absolutely lost. I can't take it anymore. This game is just as painful as stepping on a loose bit of real Lego. But I'm wearing a shirt. I mean, can you even call the subtitle of this game The Brixter's Revenge if we let him out of prison ourselves? We let him attack us. Is that even revenge?